everybody. And this is our seminar on GPS satellite and spectrum matters. And I'm pleased to introduce to you Diana Pershkot Roth, who is an Oxford educated economist with over 20 years of executive level economic policy experience in the three executive branches and White House. She's an adjunct professor of economics at George Washington University and president of Pershkot International. From 2019 to 2021, she was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology at the United States Department of Transportation. Uh, in that position, she led a staff of 1,200 and managed the department's $1 billion modal research program, including the 150 universities in the University Transportation Centers. She directed the department's spectrum interests in preserving GPS and the 5.9 gigahertz band for transportation safety. She oversaw the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, the Bolt National Transportation System uh, System Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the Transportation Safety Institute in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Prior to joining the US DOT, Diana was Acting Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the US Department of Treasury. She previously served as Chief Economist at the US Department of Labor, Chief of Staff at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and Deputy, Deputy Executive Secretary of the White House Domestic Policy Council, a frequent guest on radio and TV shows, and a Forbes columnist. Diana is, is the author or, or co-author of six books and literally hundreds of articles on economic policy. So welcome, Diana. We're so pleased to see you and hear from you. So much. And we would just love to hear what you have to say about GPS writ large. It's something near and dear to our hearts here at, at NSMA, and uh, uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you. Just wait for my slides to get up. And we'll also have a Q&A after uh, time for me. So I'll be looking at this for questions, not I'm not looking at my phone for phone stuff, just, just to be clear. <laughs> well, I thought you were going to be tweeting out everything else. <laughs> we, will, we will get that out also on our social media for sure. Well, why don't I just set uh, until the slides are up, and I want to thank you so much, Joe, for inviting me and for setting up this program. It is just a terrific program, and I have learned so much already, and I know that I'm going to learn more in the course of the next couple of days. Well, during my tenure as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology at the Transportation Department, I was honored to work with a wonderful team. We were always discussing how to advance transportation technology, how to innovate, how to give people more choices of transportation, and how to keep people safe. I had a small empire at DOT. I had the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, I had the Transportation Safety Institute in Oklahoma City, which taught classes to municipalities on how to carry hazardous materials on trains, how to keep bus systems safe, and how to investigate plane crashes. I had the Volpe National Transportation System Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where a thousand people work on fascinating aspects of transportation research, such as how to tell if someone is driving under the influence of marijuana, it's not an easy problem to solve because marijuana can stay in your blood for many weeks. I oversaw 40 university transportation centers, each with its own research agenda and each with three or four universities attached. However, what took most of my time was a small office of positioning, navigation and timing and spectrum management with about four employees, headed by the wonderful Karen Van Dyke who has spent her entire career working on spectrum issues. The interagency discussions over spectrum were intense. As all of you know, the, the Federal Communications Commission is in charge of spectrum, but the Department of Transportation is the civil lead on positioning, navigation and timing, and transportation safety. DOT's responsibility among many others, was to inform other federal agencies of transportation safety concerns, 
including those related to spectrum. To that end, DOT informed the FCC about safety concerns deserving consideration. Four major spectrum issues dominated my two-year tenure. Backing up the global positioning system, the Legato license modification, the C-band auction, which could interfere with claimed navigation systems, reallocation of safety spectrum in the 5.9 band to unlicensed Wi-Fi. Let's start with backing up the global positioning system, also known as GPS backup. On one of my first days on the job, one of my colleagues told me that DOT, i.e. my office, was supposed to provide a backup for GPS by the end of 2020. And could I call a meeting of technology providers to find out how to do it? Well, my colleague wasn't entirely wrong. It was DOT's job to back up GPS because three separate laws were passed by Congress instructing DOT to back up GPS. However, the law did say subject to appropriation and Congress had not yet appropriated the funding. Aha, I see that my slide is here. Are, I'm not sure they're clicking through. Which one do you want to go to? We'll so stop for just a minute. Uh, let's there you go. It's the Office of Research and Technology. On the very bottom left, you can hit up arrows to the right or left to go for that. Okay. Just look at the mouse on the right. There we go. Okay. The GPS depends on a constellation of 31 satellites, and uh, these are vital uh, to keeping the system going. And this has shown to be particularly important with the war in Ukraine. Last November, Russia shot down one of its own defunct satellites, presumably to show the world that it could also shoot down our operating satellites. Well, America's economy depends on GPS, a free service provided by the government. It's essential to vehicle navigation systems, general aviation, financial transactions, the electrical grid, precision agriculture, surveying, and construction. Americans use over 900 million GPS receivers. Drivers use their navigation systems daily and the fighters uh, and ambulances use, firefighters and ambulances use GPS, not paper maps, to find houses where people need emergency services. Emergency responders use GPS rather than maps to locate accident sites and get people to the hospital. You don't want to be waiting for the fire truck or ambulance when GPS is hacked or disrupted. Well, even though Congress has passed three laws requiring DOT to back up GPS, it has not allocated funding. With trillions of dollars appropriated over the past few months for infrastructure, defense spending, and domestic spending, Congress has still not allocated the funds for this really important federal fund. Other countries are backing up their GPS systems, and we should not be left behind. Russia has a type of e Loran, which uses towers to send signals that it is using in its invasion of Ukraine, while it jams GPS signals in the area to confuse defenders. China, South Korea, and Iran have e Loran based systems. The additional cost would likely be less than 10% of what is being spent on GPS every year. In order to jumpstart the process of backing up and complementing GPS, and I should tell you, uh, to cut to the chase, we did not manage to back up GPS in the three years that I was at the Department of Transportation. But my Office of the Transportation Department in January 2021 published a report outlining the advantages and disadvantages of 11 different technologies to back up GPS. 
This report called the Complementary PNT and GPS Backup Technology Demonstration Report is available online. My office methodically worked with companies to test technologies that could be used in the absence of GPS signals. These technologies tested under the same conditions for an apple-to-apple -apple comparison included terrestrial radio signals, fiber networks for timing, iridium satellites for encrypted signals, and Wi-Fi and cell signals for localization. We concluded that multiple technologies should be used to back up GPS, because technologies that are efficient in urban areas, where you can put transmitters on buildings, are not necessarily efficient for rural and maritime, where there are no buildings to put transmitters on, and where uh, NEO satellites are more efficient. At the same time that we were investigating ways to back up GPS and requesting funds, dangers to GPS were arising from federal spectrum policy. In April 2020, the FCC unanimously granted an application by Legado Networks, based in Reston, Virginia, to offer a ground-based service in spectrum, much of which is next to spectrum allocated to GPS. Legado's signals are 2 billion times as powerful as GPS signals. Just as an outdoor concert drowns out bird song, the proposed Legado 5G transmitters would overwhelm GPS signals. Federal government studies listed at gps.gov, you can find them at www.gps.gov, indicate major disruption to GPS from Legado's transmitter. Legado said it would use the newly allocated spectrum for faster 5G internet service. However, its spectrum would add only a tiny portion to spectrum the FCC has already allocated to 5G, while reducing GPS's reliability. In an unprecedented move, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, on behalf of the entire executive branch, including the Departments of Justice and State, filed a petition in May 2020 asking the FCC to reconsider. NTIA cited, quote, irreparable harms to federal government users of the global positioning system. This remains NTI's position, yet the FCC has not reconsidered its order. Now, the National Academy of Sciences is wrapping up a series of hearings and will evaluate the effects of Legado transmitters on receivers. Uh, next slide, please. There's a few to Sure. Next slide. As part of its approval to grant license modifications, the FCC requires Legado to replace federal equipment that would be damaged through its operation. But Legado was not required to pay for private sector equipment, such as car navigation systems, surveying equipment, and general aviation navigation devices. Many other companies have sold... Uh, Many other companies have told the FCC that their operations would be affected, and there are more private than federal devices. Senator Jim Inhofe, the Republican from Oklahoma in the Senate, and Representative Jim Cooper, a Democrat from Tennessee in the House, have introduced a bill in the Senate and the House to retain GPS and Satellite Communications Act that would require Legado to reimburse private companies and individuals not only the federal government, especially since the federal government has more spending power than the average American household. Over 100 million cars in the U.S. had GPS and satellite communication functions. New car navigation systems start at $500 and can cost over $1,000. That's before the 8.5% inflation that we have right now. So that's potentially $50 billion to $100 billion in damages. About 
1.5 million medium and heavy trucks had GPS systems, which are used for navigation, fleet management, routing, and electronic logging devices. The Legato system could cost the average truck $400 to replace the system. That's 3.4 trillion. GPS and satellite communications are used on tractors, on farm banks, field mapping, soil sampling, crop scouting, and yield mapping. Farms have many tractors, and farmers don't want their tractors' navigation systems to go down because of Legato. It will cost the average farmer over $2,000 per tractor to replace the system. And then scientists routinely use GPS and satellite communications to measure climate change. The American Meteorological Society, the American Geophysical Union, and weather forecasting companies told the FCC that, quote, approving Legato's proposals will negatively impact real-time environmental and storm forecasts and will have direct consequences on the safety and well-being of the American people. Republicans and Democrats in the, White, in the House and Senate have come together proposing a bill protecting consumers from interference by Legato just as the SEC protected the federal equipment. Next slide, please. Another major issue that I dealt with was dispute over radio altimeters. The problem, 5G transmitters in the C-band could adversely affect some radio altimeters, also known as radar altimeters, which are crucial to navigation systems on planes and helicopters. Radio altimeters tell pilots how far planes are above the ground, help planes land, and prevent aircraft from crashing into other aircraft and obstacles, such as hillsides in darkness and foggy weather. The new 5G rollout is good news for smartphone users, but could be bad news for air travel. The FCC's auction of this band of spectrum in the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band, known as the C band, netted over $80 billion to the U.S. Treasury, and companies paid an additional $13 billion to satellite companies. The purchase of the rights to licenses in the spectrum enables these companies to deploy the faster 5G technology on their networks and attract more customers. But these transmissions may interfere with the, operate, uh, with the operation of some radio alternatives. A study published in October 2020 by RTCA stated, and I quote, that the results presented in this report reveal a major risk that 5G telecommunications systems in the 3.7 to 3.98 gigahertz band will cause harmful interference to radar altimeters on all types of civil aircraft, including commercial transport airplanes, business, regional and general aviation airplanes, and both transport and general aviation helicopters. The results of the study uh, clearly indicate that the risk is widespread and has the potential for broad impacts to aviation operations in the United States, including the possibility of catastrophic failures leading to multiple fatalities in the absence of appropriate mitigation. Potential problems have been raised in 2015 by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. Concerns came directly to me in 2019 in meetings of the Interdepartment Radio Advisory Committee, also known as IRAP. The Federal Aviation Administration and Congress continued to warn the FCC about the dangers of 5G transmitters on airline safety. House trans Transportation and Infrastructure Chairman Peter DeFazio wrote to then FCC Chairman Ajit Pai in November 2019 and December 2020, laying out the problems. In 2019, Chairman DeFazio wrote, quote, unless the FCC imposes mitigations that will conclusively prevent adverse effects to aviation safety, I strongly object to the FCC's proposal to repurpose portions of the sea land. Airline industry groups such as the Airline Pilots Association and the Airline Manufacturers Association submitted joint comments warning about dangers to aviation in the spectrum auction. The joint filing stated that, quote, 
Since 2017, the aviation industry has consistently noted during the FCC rulemaking process that deployment of 5G networks in the frequency band may introduce harmful radio frequency interference to radar altimeters currently operating in the globally allocated 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz band. A letter dated December 2020 from the Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Steve Bradley, and the Federal Aviation Administrator, Steve Dixon, to the National Telecommunications and Information Administrator of the Department of Commerce, expressing concern about airline safety, uh, is now on the uh, FAA website. However, at the time, MTIA would not transmit the letter to the FCC. Bradbury and Dixon wrote, given the scope of the safety risk and based on the current knowledge, it's unclear what measures will be necessary to ensure safe operations in the national aerospace system or how long it will take to implement such measures. Depending on the results of further analysis, it may be appropriate to place restrictions on certain types of operations, which would reduce access to core airports in the US and reduce the capacity and efficiency of commercial aviation." Unquote. By refusing to send a letter over to the FCC and put it in the public record, NTI withheld important information from the bids about the federal government's reasonable concern about potential liabilities associated with the C-band that might affect the value of the spectrum. If the wireless companies had known that the head of the FAA had concerns about airline safety, they might not have bid $93 billion for the spectrum. It was not only the FAA that had concerns. On December 17, 2021, the European Union Aviation Safety Agency, the European safety equivalent of the FAA, issued its own safety information bulletin warning about potential interference. And in November 2021, Canada placed restrictions on 5G transmitters, including exclusion zones around 26 airports where outdoor 5G base stations would not be permitted. Some people think that the interference problem is just a matter of swapping out one radio altimeter for another the way you can take one easy pass out of a car and put it in another. But it's not so simple. Radio altimeters are tied into plane systems, and some newer altimeters control more internal systems than our older ones. So it's not even a matter of replacing old altimeters for new ones. But all existing radio altimeters are designed to technical standard orders prepared for the former environment, which did not include 5G. No standards exist for the new, uh, for the new high-powered terrestrial wireless environment. Um, next slide. Oh, uh, let's move on to the 5.9 band, which also took up a lot of its time. And are we on the slide you want to be on? I'm looking for slide 11. Slide 11. Yes, it's A lot of my time at DOT was spent on the FCC's decision to take 45 megahertz out of the 75 megahertz in the 5.9 band and reserve for automobile safety and intelligent transportation systems. A slice of spectrum we call the safety band. Safety bands and spectrum airwaves may not be household terms, but anyone driving Americans' roads should care. Connected vehicle technology using spectrum can prevent cars crashing into each other and killing or injuring passengers. Other countries are setting aside the same band of spectrum for auto safety, and US drivers should have access to the latest life-saving equipment. Just as you can't build a house without dedicated real estate, 
you can't build life-saving intelligent transportation systems without space. To develop safer cars and automated vehicles, companies need specs. During the pandemic, when the nation's highways looked like ghost towns, car crashes actually increased. Deaths on the road rose by 8%, and injuries rose by 24%, even as driving declined. Over 38,000 people were killed on the roads. Over the objections of the Department of Transportation, the FCC voted in November to take away half of the spectrum, over half the spectrum of the safety net. And the FCC also banned the most popular technology using spectrum for connected vehicles for dedicated short-range communications, instead of instead requiring an unproven technology for CBS. American motorists deserve better, and the National Transportation Safety Board agreed. The NTSB, an independent government agency responsible for safety across all modes of travel, including, included preserving the spectrum airwaves for collision avoidance in its 10 most wanted list of transportation safety approvals. The NTSB announced its members were alarmed by the recent regulatory decision by the FCC to substantially shrink the communication spectrum dedicated to connected vehicle technology. Although the FCC filed its objections with the, uh, although the NTSB filed its objections with the FCC before the decision was made, the FCC took no notice. Neither did the FCC heed the multiple safety warnings of the U.S. Department of Transportation. Rather, the FCC wanted to allocate transportation spectrum to unlicensed Wi-Fi the Wi-Fi that pops up on your phone when you're in an airport and it asks you if you want to connect. These devices are extraordinarily useful to customers, but Wi-Fi already operates in many different bands without encroaching on the safety band. Consider that as the FCC was taking away 45 megahertz of the spectrum, it had already allocated an additional 1,200 megahertz to unlicensed Wi-Fi elsewhere. Next slide. States have deployed transportation safety projects all over the country and are looking at new technologies. The FCC received proposals for about 1,000 more projects in the safety band that have not been approved. But these proposed safety projects, as well as existing ones, would, were scrapped under the FCC's new rules. In conclusion, the FCC is independent and has complete discretion over the complete allocation of non-federal spectrum. It regards the public interest as having more spectrum for unlicensed Wi-Fi and less for transportation safety. This can be seen with GPS backup, with Legado, with radio alternatives, with the safety band. Those of us who travel, or have friends and family who travel, need to have the FCC reverse this view. It's a tough sell. Dozens of companies would benefit from free Wi-Fi and 5G, and they lobby the FCC every day. Ordinary people who would benefit from safety do not. Well, thanks for listening, and I'd be glad to take a few questions. Well, that was fantastic, and thank you for uh, going through the, uh, you know, there's a whole Venn diagram of issues that are uh, on top of this, and uh, clearly there seems to be a major disconnect on uh, the ability for GPS to operate with stability and, uh, and safety. Um, using that, that as a North Star, do you have any opinions on uh, real-life testing uh, of certain criteria, yeah, let's say at the Idaho National Labs or somewhere prior to the FCC ever approving other plan? So, uh, there was a lot of testing done by the Department of Transportation, which has many, many engineers devoted to these issues. And our testing did show that uh, there would be interference. And what is your understanding of the FCC's understanding of those tests? Did they participate, or were they able to participate, or were they able to participate but didn't? Or how would you characterize that? We were certainly informed of the results of the test. Yes, but then outside parties were also doing tests, and in some cases the FCC said that it believed those outside parties, some of whom might have had an interest in the outcome. Interesting. So, 
And in this way, we're a lot of engineers, so we just look at empirical data. So typically, a replicable study, let's say a new T study, assuming it's replicable, then that would be that, right? So there seems to be something in the uh, testing evaluation process uh, that is amiss. Is that a fair way to state it? Right, yes, yes, that's right, that's right. The SEC engineers didn't agree with the engineers. Yeah, and clearly, um, obviously, GPS is front and center with our, uh, our multiple uh, safety related and just day to day life to life, day -to -day life, -to -life uh, uh, systems. It certainly is. And I believe that was the U.S. Coast Guard that took down the last terrestrial system, of, I guess, back in April of 2021 or somewhere around there. And I think what you were stating was now it's time to, to, to put up an you know, interwoven layer of, of backed up GPS systems. Is that, is that a. During the Obama administration, the Eagle Ram, which was yeah. a terrestrial system, yeah. was taken down. Yeah. And during the Obama administration, not in 2021. Okay, I think maybe it was the last part of the right. state. Yeah. But it uh, already was not working by 2021 because it was basically taken down during the Obama administration. Yeah. So, in terms of. And you're thinking about clarification. So, in terms of restoring it or a or more modern equivalent or, or a series of modern equivalents, because you also noted maritime and, and rural America are different animals, right? So, we may need different uh, systems uh, for backup. Right. And I would encourage anyone who's interested to look at our complementary GPS and backup report, which is several hundred pages on the Department of Transportation website, uh, where we go through the many criteria. 11 different technologies that were tested. They were tested in basements, uh, high up in the air, under many different circumstances. And there are various diagrams to show the results of those things. Plus, there, since then, this was, uh, uh, this was a couple of years ago, there's new technology coming in all the time. There's a wide variety of technology to choose from. And the question is, should the federal government, which, which provides GPS, be responsible for backing it up, or should individual companies purchase these services themselves and back up their own systems? So, for example, banks back up their own systems and purchase purchase uh, technology to back up their own systems because it's required to have very accurate timekeeping records. Uh, a, a trade that is a, 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 not only a few minutes, a few seconds, a few nanoseconds off. Uh, is very different, uh, the financial implications when markets move. But something like a fire station or uh, a sheriff's office, it's unclear how they would get the technology to back something up. Or if you have GPS backing up in one municipality, but yet your fire engine has to go to another municipality to fight a fire, how is that going to happen if the second municipality does not pay for the backup of the first municipality? Yeah, and these are these are core engineering issues, and it, it sort of begs a standard. I, I, as you, I think you mentioned the VPN GPS and Satellite Communications Act, uh, it probably touches on some of this. And then, is there a process, an IEEE process, or a uh, ITU process, or uh, an IRAC process, or, or a combination of processes and guidelines? You think that would be a, a north star for the industry going forward? That we're kind of belts and suspenders before we right. start playing with this? Certainly different standards groups are looking at designs for the seasons and yeah. are looking at those. But as to the question of whether a particular municipality or a town or a port purchases backup services, that has to do with those individual entities and that has to do with the funding that these entities have. Interesting. When 9-11 occurred, uh, Building 7, fell into, the you know, Twin Towers went down, but there was a 50-story building, Building 7, that fell on the horizon. Uh, roughly 30 uh, telephone networks, 30 broadband networks went down. One or two stayed up. Uh, those were, uh, there was no federal standard at the time for, for physical diversity, uh, but there were a couple of networks that stayed up. And what came out of that was Public Law 108-447, Section 414, which later became an OMB Circular 65, which basically set up a set of guidelines for physical diversity. Um, and I think what I hear you saying, and correct me if I misunderstand that, if there was a set of guidelines, and by the way, that, that public law was a denial of funds legislation, so federal agencies would lose their funding 
they didn't abide by it. So it had some real teeth to it. And I'm wondering if there's something roughly similar in the GPS world that would be useful to make sure there's physical diversity backed up with real guidelines that are where empirical data and studies show you know, we have full physical diversity if you know if, if a large satellite network went down or if you know a, a terrestrial network went down there would be some backup. Is that is that your North Star? Is that your trouble? Well, rather rather than including these different standards, what Congress did in the NDA of twenty seventeen, the National Defense Authorization Act of twenty eighteen and the National Time and Resilience Act was to require the Department of Transportation to put in the backup for your system pieces, rather than require standardization so individual groups could do it on their own. So three different laws Congress passed DOT to do this, subject to appropriation. So the question is, with a trillion spent on infrastructure, why didn't they have out uh, a small, a tiny, tiny fraction of that to back up GPS? Good question, yeah. <laughs> And uh, what are your uh, what, what what are your thoughts on coming back to that and getting some sort of carve out going forward? What's the what's the uh, environment for getting? I think there is bipartisan support for backing up GPS, and the war in Ukraine has shown how important it is right now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, again, that's a, such a front and center issue. I think it goes to every American. And uh, as far as I can tell, and, uh, I think that most of our members would agree. Um, I, I've been asking some questions, I think, that were. We have one more question from the audience. Then. We have one more? Uh, okay. Uh, it says Should a GPS backup system be satellite or terrestrial based or both? Should a GPS satellite a backup system be terrestrial based, satellite, or both is the question. Uh, so different environments require different kinds of backup. And uh, for an urban system, uh, a transmitted base uh, works best. And uh, uh, we looked at the metropolitan, we looked at 11 different technologies. Uh, NextNav's metropolitan beacon system did particularly well in urban areas. And uh, in rural and maritime areas, uh, the satellite system, which we would rely on, the Iridium constellation of satellites, low Earth orbit satellites which there are many, by the way, not just 31 uh, satellites, many satellites, uh, was very effective and efficient. But since then, there are not any other technologies that have come up uh, that the Transportation Department of Policy have also examined. But the reason you don't necessarily need the same system, terrestrial, uh, uh, for um, both is, first of all, the low Earth orbit satellites are a form of terrestrial because they're very low. But over maritime and rural areas, you don't have uh, the buildings or the telephone posts to put the beacons on. So that's not as efficient as some other kinds of technology. But the bottom line was that we need diverse technologies for different kinds of environments, and we should test to look at the latest technology. Well, you, you have a home uh, in our hearts with testing, and we love testing. And more the better. Uh, measure twice, cut once. Measure thrice, cut once. So um, I know we've hit the uh, our, our deadline on this segment, but uh, we'd love to have you back. We'd love to learn more about what you're thinking about developments, and um, you know, uh, and this may develop guidelines that were created by the FCC to develop guidelines with industry, with other federal agencies. Uh, this started in 1984. This is our 37th annual conference, and it just seems like. Given every panel today, the, the spectrum world has become more and more complex. It does require more and more engineering and guidelines and testing. As far as we can tell, and we're really in group of that. So uh, thank you for your uh, bringing your history and your, your story to our, to our attention. And uh, again, we'd love to hear more from you in the future uh, and, your, and your colleagues. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Joseph.